Welcome, welcome everybody. What's going on with y'all? How y'all doing? Hey guys. Y'all can do a little bit better. I know it's a little bit of y'all, but y'all can do a little better. How y'all doing today? All right, this better, this better. You know, we're going to get there. Mm-hmm. But welcome to a very, very special um, podcast recording in honor of I Will Listen Campaign Week here at Morgan State University. Uh, I am Taryn Morgan alongside Miss Kalia Wright. Yeah. What's going on? What's going on? Uh, and we'll be talking about mental health this afternoon. Um, but before we actually jump in, I want to give a little background about NAMI Metro Baltimore, who made this possible. Um, NAMI Metropolitan Baltimore is a local nonprofit that focuses on providing providing uh, support groups, um, education classes, public education uh, programs about mental health uh, for people who live with mental health or who may have family members or friends who may have mental health issues. Um, This week is actually the sixth I will listen weeks. So that's very big right there, you know, you know. Um, and there's a week-long mental health education and advocacy campaign for colleges and universities within Baltimore County. And uh, Morgan State University is a proud partner of this campaign, and we're recording at Morgan State University Student Center Theater. So let's get into the introductions. Yes. Tell, tell me about yourself. Tell me about yourself. Um, so hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out today. Uh, so my name is Kalila Wright, and I am the owner of an empowerment brand and it's called mess in a bottle um, we put messages on t-shirts and they come packaged in a reusable bottle um, I started the company in 2016 um, shortly after Freddie Gray an African-American male he died while in police custody and it happened in my um, Baltimore City community and it really prompted me to want to figure out a way of you know giving change to my community so I started mess in a bottle as a form of communication and um, you know just like my shirt says today, like on my way to therapy, be, be right back. And so I started creating messages just for, you know, people who maybe didn't know how to advocate for themselves or to have a voice. And so, you know, Mess in a Bottle is really not just a t-shirt company, but it's really a communication tool. I think that um, a lot of you may relate to and understand in the room that, you know, not everyone is able to be very articulate with their feelings or if something is going on or, you know, so it's almost like you're able to stand in solidarity with someone by wearing a message. Um, I'm also a graduate of Morgan State University. I I obtained my master's in architecture here um, in 2010. Thank you. So um, I'm really excited to be here today and, you know, to hopefully inspire and get you guys, you know, motivated and, you know, kind of on track with some of this as well. Uh, thank you for letting us know about uh, yourself a little bit and your company. Definitely sounds dope, the work you're doing. Um, now, for y'all, y'all may know me from doing the videos, uh, eSports coach, but I'm a multifaceted individual, you know, like a lot of people are. And it's good that y'all see the different dimensions uh, of, of professionals, black, black professionals, really. So that's why you see me out here dressed up and getting the creative juices going, you know. But um, I am the host of the Miseducation of the People podcast, which focuses on decolonizing our thoughts, especially when it comes to stuff we were talking at school, um, giving the real advice stuff about, you know, relationships, mental health. Um, I share my stories about being a former F-boy because, you know, you know better, you do better. So I'm trying to pass those lessons down. And it's also a part of my media production company called the Real Talk Session Series, where we produce... uh, educational edutainment, I say education and, and entertainment, uh, content catered towards empowering and uplifting black communities across the country. So the podcast is one of the ways we do it, but also produce videos too. So, you know, just out here spreading awareness and really helping others out. And that's actually how uh, I, I created this was during my mental health battle, my, my first time experiencing mental health. But uh, we will definitely talk about that later on, you know, a little bit more. But um, why... In particular, do you think it is important for um, you to be a part of the I Will Listen campaign at Morgan State University? I mean, I think that it's really important um, because... Students, as I said before, you need an advocate. You need um, people to stand beside you. Mm -hmm. You need to really feel like you are, you know, being heard. Um, And I think that that's really important. I think that um, especially when you go off to college, um, you know, I went to Penn State University uh, for undergrad. And at Penn State, um, it was a predominantly white institution in which I felt really out of place in school, um, especially in architecture. Architecture is a very white male dominated field um, engineering as well so you know being in a coming from Brooklyn New York and then migrating to 
It's literally called Happy Valley, Pennsylvania, where it's in the middle of nowhere, where, you know, it's a little bit of a shell shock for the people, you know, who live there, um, who not who may not be as cultured um, to then myself, who I'm now going to a high school, you know, that was very diverse to now being in a place where it's I'm the only, you know, black student in the auditorium that was like five times the size. And so, you know, for me, it was really difficult. And I think when you go off to college, especially, you know, I think when you're like 17, 18, and I actually graduated early from high school, so I went off to college at 17. At 17, I'm still trying to figure things out, you know, this adulthood that, that I'm like, I joke all the time, I became an adult at like 35-ish, like somewhere around there, so you kind of, you know, the students in here, you guys might have a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. Like, it just doesn't feel like some of the, you know, the things that adults, you know, and adulting, it doesn't really happen. Um, you know, there's a lot of experience, a lot of lessons that the, that you still have to to sort of go through and make and so I think being a part of like I will listen it will help you to um you know connect with others that I think might um you know have similar similar issues yeah and the whole adulting thing I, I, I think <laughs> as well like you think that you may have it done down pack you're not living with your parents anymore but it's like new levels you get to a video game it's new levels new challenges and whatnot so fun times um and similar to you I did go to a PWI. I went to William Patterson University um, in Patterson, New Jersey. Um, born and raised in New Jersey. Then I came down here for my first master's degree um, in higher education administration. Then I got my second master's degree at uh, Fairleigh Dix University. And seeing the different dynamics from an HBCU to PWI is very, very different. When I came here, I was extremely shell-shocked. Like, my school system did not talk about blackness at all. Um, I thought that Abraham Lincoln was the man because he freed slaves, not knowing the history behind it, you know? So for me, like, just really getting a true history in teaching myself, because, again, like, miseducation, in the schools, you're taught certain things, but this was kind of like my opening. And when you spoke about Freddie Ray, I actually was at the PWI um, up in New Jersey, and I came to work just not, I was there physically, I was not there mentally at all. Mm -hmm. But being at a PWI, everyone had smiles on, cheerful. They didn't know what was going on. And I'm like, really? You don't know what happened to this man? And for me, coming back to Morgan was big because I see individuals that look like me. I see young men who are going, who are going through some of the stuff that I've been through, but I'm able to actually provide them the tools to actually get through it in a positive manner compared to what I did. You know, So for me, um, I actually experienced much, uh, depression, anxiety and suicidal ideation um back in 2018 and i'm still battling you know healing isn't linear it's ups and downs mm. and for me i use my story to help other people out you know that's why i will listen is important because i'm an education uh, educator nat uh, naturally but for me it's my own unique way of actually helping out people who are suffering in silence because with mental health there's a lot of stigma associated with it you know right. and the only way to really combat that is by using our stories AKA I will listen, you know? So that's why, you know, it's very big for me to be a part of the I will listen campaign here at Morgan State University and to represent for the black men. Cause a lot of us, we have that stigma of boys don't cry or, you know, you don't sort of emotions or whatnot. So, you know, just trying to show that it is okay to be human is to be emotional. Yeah, so, you know, for sure. that's a part of it. Definitely. So why is mental health so important to you? And I'm going to add a little bit onto that. When did you actually start focusing on taking care of your mental health? Well, I think growing up, again, in Brooklyn, New York, um, I saw a lot, you know, a lot of trauma, a lot of things that, you know, even growing up, um, I was born in Jamaica, West Indies, and um, coming from another country, being an immigrant, coming to America, sort of my parents, you know, a lot of immigrant, like, similar story in which you are pulled apart from your parents. I didn't grow up with my mom or my dad. I grew up with my grandmother. And I think that there was a lot of trauma associated with that. And this is from four years old that there was a lot of trauma there. And I don't think that a lot of us realize, like, sort of what that trauma does to us. And even, you know, so something that I remember at four years old is something that now at 37 still lives with me. And it's from being separated and being pulled apart from my parents at such a young age and I think that um, you know for me 
I was probably introduced uh, to therapy um, at Morgan State University. Um, one of my very good friends, um, he was killed while I was in uh, from Brooklyn, New York. And I literally was having a very difficult time. And at that point, I just knew that this was beyond me to fix mentally. And I reached out to Morgan and some of the, you know, um, some resources here, and they put me in touch with a therapist on campus because I literally could not sleep. You know, I had a very difficult time coping with um, his death. And um, I started my therapy path then. Um, and it was really helpful because I think that what I did not understand was almost like the different, you know, stages of grief and really dealing with someone dying and, you know, understanding sort of life and, you know, and then understanding death. And so there was a lot associated and attached to that. And so I think therapy is really built where, again, a professional is there to really help you to figure out how to navigate your thoughts, you know, um, some of the, you know, negative thoughts and even the things that I said, like we're at four years old, something traumatic happened to me that I didn't know how much would still be of an impact, you know, 37 years later. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's really important to tap into, you know, having, um, a professional to really tell you or to let you know what are the best ways, what's the healthy ways to cope with things like that as well. Um, and also allowing ourselves to sort of feel and kind of go through it. Um, and I think that that was really important. So that was my very first kind of interaction with a therapist. Okay, cool, cool, cool. And speaking of grief too, we have a lot of grief within the black community. Um, and not just necessarily when it comes to deaths, but even relationships, losing jobs, etc. So a lot of people aren't taught how to deal with grief. Even careers. Yeah. Like imagine like or even college. Yeah. You know, I know for me as well, um, I received when I was at um when I was at Penn State, I received my first F. And I was, you know, I was a pretty good student. And so to receive that F was like definitely detrimental for me because I'm like my my family's not going to pay for me to do another year of school mm -hmm. you know I might fail out of architecture um, like there was so much associated and attached to that and I think that you know for me it took me again some time to really cope with you know like even the thought of failure and like that it's okay to fail and to you know and to pick yourself back up and so I think that again that's something that a lot of people are not speaking about with students um, you know, I think sometimes you go off to college and you think that it's going to be this really easy transition and, you know, you have kids who go off to college and they've done really amazing at high school and they get to college and they don't do as well. You know, imagine I said that there was an auditorium that's about five times the size of this. So imagine you're going to a place where you may have had 25, 30 kids in a classroom to now 2,500 kids in a classroom yep. and expected to also independently learn you know, feed yourself, make mistakes, you know, like you're giving money, financial aid, like there's so many responsibilities, you know, sort of thrown at you um, as a, a student. And then for you, you know, so if you happen to fail a class, like, you know, you can understand how it happens, but I think it's definitely a big blow to your mental health. Yeah, absolutely. And like even through kind of like a cultural spin in there too, because some families who are not from America, they put a very big emphasis on education and you better get it right or else you know but I understand it definitely but I know for me um, grief has been something big I come from a very large family and ultimately with a very large family means that a lot of people has pa have passed in my life so I think earliest I can remember was probably my aunt I, I, she was I was in second or third grade or something like that and that was like my homie coming home eating grand, crack grand crackers watching Simpsons all day and then one day she just wasn't there and then over the years, just seeing how, you know, from that moment, as children, we're not taught how to grieve. We're not taught what death is. We just see our family members keeping the stone face, keeping it moving, no crying. And I kept that up. Right. And along with coming where uh, from, from, you know, if you cry, you show emotions, you're automatically a target and quote unquote soft. So at that point, I built a mental dam. And it wasn't until like college where I was actually exposed to what mental health education is, how to identify an individual who's going through traumas, how to assist them, and I was doing my resident assistant training, but at 18 years old, I'm like, I never heard of mental health all my life, so I still had that Superman complex of, this will never happen to me, and um, also during college, uh, 
as I'm sure a lot of y'all are probably getting that freedom for the first time. I was kind of sheltered also. And I was out here bugging, bugging. Mm-hmm. Um, like, you realize that your untreated childhood trauma influences who you are today, in the future, all throughout your life. Definitely. And for me, I was just feeling numb. And, you know, I had a lot of trauma stuff I was going through my mind. And I resorted to liquor and sex as a way to make myself feel whole, not realizing that I was just digging myself into a deeper hole, really. So for me, that mental dam that I built and I learned the, the positive ways to cope with it, it began to, well, the mental dam began to crumble probably towards the end of 2017. And then I learned through that period that I have to do stuff that's positive to take care of my mental, you know? So for me, I had a lot of irritable uh, mood swings and whatnot. Like, I was very happy to go like God always joking around. But at the time, I would get mad like that. And it would feel like the Incredible Hulk. Like, I want to rip my shirt off, smash windows and all that stuff. But, like, it was to the point where I never took care of my mental health all these years. And now they're just rushing through. They broke their mental damn down. And it's kind of like a baby coming into the world, right. learning how to deal with emotions for the first time. And that was my journey back in 2018, just learning how to deal with it and to really put an emphasis on taking care of self, especially with stress. Y'all don't realize with stress. I will do it. I went to the hospital because I had pain in my left shoulder, pain in my, over my heart, um, felt dizzy, ringing in my ears. I could pass out any given time. At 30 years old, went to the hospital. I thought I was going to have a heart attack or a stroke or something like that. It was stress. Mm-hmm. So that's something I had to learn, like to get a positive outlet to take care of your stress and whatnot. And ever since then, like once you actually take care of your mental you improve in so many areas of your life. It's definitely worth it, um, 1,000%. So, we've been going through this pandemic. Mm-hmm. The pandemonium, mm-hmm. Pandora, <laughs> all that stuff, right? The podium at this point. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, it's been crazy. So, how has the past year and a half have changed your perspective on your mental health and wellness? So, what has it taught you, taught you about yourself? Well, so, you know, when it comes to coping and sort of, thinking about like how to deal with mental health um you know I am a person that I go to I see a therapist on a regular basis as part of my doctor regimen so the same way you go to the doctor if you have a cough it's the same way that I make sure that I have a therapist on call and see her um at least probably every two weeks or twice a month minimum and so for me um you know when the pandemic first hit um I think I was a a bit in denial like I went through a denial phase because I was like we're not going to be in the house that long. And so I think for me, I decided in that moment that I would not overeat. I would not stress myself too much. I wanted to continue with my regular regimen, and that includes running. And I'm a big like runner and advocate for running. And so for me, I used that time to really, you know, and... I did not overwhelm myself with work because that was the other thing. Um, I think I kind of ignored what was happening and tried to go about things just regular. But then eventually I was like, okay, after a year, I was like, all right, there's no more regular to this. Like there's a new normal. Um, But what I did was really focused on, you know, um, and really running, you know, that was like my big thing. And um, allowing myself, like if I needed a day to kind of like, relax I would I mean I think as a mom and as a single mom you know my son had to really adjust to homeschooling and that was a lot as well for both of us and so I think you know and I'm a person where I allow myself every day to sort of start start over again so like if I'm having a difficult day today you know I tell myself if I'm able to wake up again tomorrow let's try it again and let's do this again and let's do it better and so for me you know I allowed myself I mean I do think that I unfortunately I ran but then I negatively coped with work like I used to you know like I wasn't I overworked for a period of time and then I had to realize like I had to stop so I think that that was me trying to be in denial phase that this thing wasn't really happening with the world Mm -hmm. um, because I didn't want it to put me in a depression mode yeah. I wasn't sure what would happen with my business I wasn't sure if it would affect my business negatively I wasn't sure like how long we would be doing this for it was just shake and like I had things planned so I had a marathon planned I had travel planned I had things planned you know and so I just was like 
I don't know what's happening. Yeah. And so I think for me, you know, I kind of overworked myself at first in the very beginning. Mm-hmm. But once I realized, like, all right, you got to relax, I then, you know, kind of pulled things back. And I, I took some time to kind of rearrange and sort of say, all right, you had other goals, like maybe focus on other things. But I think one of the big things I did was, like, I really focused on my health. And so, like, running, eating well, you know, like, that was big for me in the mental health part of it. So I would see yeah. my therapist on a regular basis. And I really forced myself to like eat well during this time, which not a lot of people did. A lot of people that went the work. opposite that's road, next. and they were like, "We home, home. Like this yeah. is the COVID, you know, fifteen that's happening." And so um, I was like, "I already went through that with freshman year, so I already know how that could do." So I was just like, "Yeah, no." So you know, I think I really allowed myself in that moment to to in a healthy way cope with what was happening. Okay, that's good, definitely. Um, running definitely is clutch for me, too. But, man, listen, this has been a while, a year and a half for me, for real. Um, so, I actually went on disability back in 2019, um, and I actually was terminated because of everything with my uh, mental health stuff going on. So, I was just really getting off my feet um, and just re- figuring out what I'm going to do with life in general. Like, I was done with higher education. Like, I was burnt out. I didn't want to come back at all. Um, then I just left a um, nonprofit that was extremely, extremely, extremely toxic. So, mm-hmm. I'm like, I don't know where I'm going. Um, but luckily, I was able to get back to Morgan State University and doing some remote work when it comes to marketing. But... Um, the pandemic actually started off engaged, but we went separate ways, you know, mm. going back to showing like untreated childhood trauma, mm. how it comes back up in every part of your life, especially relationships and whatnot. Mm. So for me, it was more so a story of resilience and seeing how good I am with getting back on my feet every single time I fall on my behind. Um, with the pandemic, I know that it's really put me in a period of solitude because I had some family issues going on also where I had to move down to Baltimore on my own last minute on some emergency fund stuff and just live in solitude. And that really taught me that the peace that you look outward for is really within you. Within, to create sure. that peace within the chaos because it gets real, real out here. Yeah. You got to know how to tone out people's opinions, uh, social media getting off of that. And just really finding what works for you. So I know you gotta kill the noise. That's what I always say to myself. Like, exactly. Block out that noise. Mm-hmm. And for me, I did a lot of stuff that talked talked to my inner child. So going back to playing video games more, mm. puzzles, just going outside. Working. Was that therapy recommended? Um, I didn't have insurance, so I therapized myself. <laughs> okay, I was just curious. That's an interesting model of, you know, but that sounds really good, yeah. though. And that's one thing, too, like, with all my years of training and just researching, I'm a very proactive person when it comes to just self-advancement, and especially when it came to my handling with mental health, because I'm like, this is new. I'm not trying to be in more pain than I need to be. Right. So, you know, just really taking the work on my end. Um, I'm a very spiritual person, so they say faith without works is dead. Mm-hmm. So I had to put that work in. You know, you can believe that you're going to get better, but you also have to do things to make you feel better, too. So this year and a half really has showed me that, you know, <laughs> you, you, it don't matter what happens with life, um, you want to adjust. Yeah. One thing that Mike Tyson said is that you can plan all you want, but once you get punched in your face, that plan goes out of, uh, Ooh, that's goes a good out of the window, one. right? Yeah. But then you have to learn, okay, they punch him, right? All right, boom. I got the rhythm of the block. Now I can block. All right, cool. I got the block down. Now I can counter. All right, now I can do some slips, some other things. So really just learning how to adjust, that's one thing that has been big for me the past year and a half, for real. So you are a very successful entrepreneur, you know, black Thank woman you. out here doing a thing. So you mm-hmm. out here. So how do you balance growing and maintaining your business while making time for your self-care? So, um, as I said, like my self care is really rooted in me, in my health. Like, you know, it's, it's funny because, you know, the term health is wealth. And I really do believe that, you know, the better I feel just emotionally, physically, um, you know, it makes me better. Like, it makes me better even for my son. You know, it, uh, it gives me a space where I'm able to, you know, actually go out. Like, it, it's, 
it takes a lot to wake up at like 5 a.m., 6 a.m. and run in the morning, especially when you could just sleep in. Mm -hmm. um, it also takes a lot to like eat well and, you know, but it makes you feel better, you know. And so I think the balance truly comes with some days I'm um, being an exceptional mom and kicking butt and feeling like I'm getting things done. And then other days, um, you know, not being the greatest entrepreneur and some things might be falling short. So I think giving myself that grace and allowing myself to like be like, okay, today is a great mom day or today is a great business day or today is a great you day. You know, I must say I probably don't do the best at possibly, um, I'm not going to say treat myself because I buy myself everything and anything and any day and, I'm, you know, my accountant doesn't agree, but I would say I don't do the greatest job with maybe, you know, doing something I want just for me. Um, that's still something I'm working on and something that I'm learning. I still tie things back to the business. You know, if I'm traveling, if I'm going somewhere, it's not really always for me. A lot of times it's still like business related or, you know, um, just associated with stuff for the business and not per se for me. So I think right now, one of the good things about even being an entrepreneur, I try to, um, you know, my girlfriends, if they're doing stuff, I try to do it with them. Um, you know, I allow myself to enjoy things, you know, even for my son, if we're hanging out, sometimes I try my best to, you know, either put my phone down or, you know, just allow us to enjoy moments because I just know that's like what you hold on to, you know, that's kind of all you have at the end of this. So, you yeah. You know, I think for me is I try to balance, but I allow myself to fall short. And when I do, you know, just do better the next day. And the important thing you said there is grace, extending yourself grace. Like we go so hard on ourselves. Um, we extend other people grace, but we don't necessarily give us ourselves that same energy, you know. So that's one thing that's very big. And especially like I don't know if we have any entrepreneurs out there, um, but definitely finding that balance is crucial, crucial, crucial. Um, I claim myself as an entrepreneur the past year and a half. Like I do video, I do esports, I do marketing, I do event production, whatever you name, I, I got my hand on a little bit. But just find that balance, and especially when it comes to your relationships with people in general, like getting that time to actually reconnect with people, to have those conversations, to say I love you or whatnot. Those are different it's things. It's important. So it's very important. Yeah. 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 And I and I know even for me, you know, I always tell my family and friends, like, you know, invite me, you know, because they still feel like, oh, my gosh, you're too big to kind of come to our little stuff. But I'm like, no, I, that's what matters to me is, you know, and I think it helps to keep you grounded. Yeah, for sure. And so, you know, I try if I can make it. I'm like, I want to go. Those are the memories. Those are the pictures. Those are the things you're going to look yeah. at. And, you know, and it helps keep you human. You know, right now we're such in a social media world where, you know, even every Everything on social media is filtered. It's it's you know it's a perception of, and so I like the things that still keep me to remember who I was with that young child. Even though I had the trauma, it still reminds me of the human days. You know, days where it's not a filtered picture. So yeah. I think kind of that's what I focus on. Okay, okay. So like touching back on childhood in general, right? So did you have anybody around you, whether it's family, friends, etc., talking about mental health and why is it important at all? Probably not. I don't think, you know, I think in my era, probably the mental health part of it didn't get cool till maybe 10 years ago, it yep. seems like, or even, you know, like around five to 10 years ago, that's when I feel like people really have been starting to talk about mental health. Mm -hmm. it's, it's where people, you know, are like, okay with going or proud of going and you still have a lot of pushback you know but I think you know even creating a message like this and having someone wear it um, saying you know I'm on my way to therapy you know I think even that is really big because not a lot of people, there was a lot of shame in saying that you see a therapist. Yeah. And so I think for me, anytime I speak or anytime I do any type of, you know, podcast, anything, I'm big to want to say that, you know, I go to therapy, I enjoy therapy, therapy is okay. Um, because I think that more people need to know that, even our parents. Absolutely. You know, I think our parents, like there, there has been a lot of trauma that wasn't resolved because our parents are just like, what, what do you need a third party for? Yep. And I think that it's important. Um, you know, I think what I try to do is allow myself to go through it so that hopefully my parents could know that it's okay, my friends and family, and even my son, so that if he ever has to go to therapy, he's not ashamed by it. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's very important. Um, 
And by the way, if you're watching on Facebook, uh, please drop some questions in there. Uh, we definitely will uh, answer those later on. And also, we'll catch you on the replay, whether it's YouTube, your pod, the podcast, um, et cetera, definitely. But um, I know for me, just talking about mental health, um, it really wasn't a thing that was talked about positively where I'm from. Um, a lot of times, you would see people walking down the street talking to themselves, and they kind of be like just kept to the side, like, what's going on with them? They're crazy or big dummies, whatever, you hear all that stuff. So there's a lot of negativity. So going back to like I was telling you about the mental dam I built, you know, that was something that wasn't there for me. But I had to do that education and really learn on my own because a lot of people are very uninformed um, and educated when it comes to mental health stuff. But and especially when you're talking about fa- parents, boy, it's, it's crazy. But, you know, it's, it's one of those things of I see a lot of people are coming around to the idea of it now. Yeah. And especially with them, they were kind of like, we keep our business in house. Oh, my gosh. But those are the civil rights <laughs> babies right there. Yeah. Like, so yeah. they have a lot of respective racial trauma right there, too, which really affects our mental health also. So that's something that is definitely, definitely big. Um, so what was something that you wish you knew earlier about taking care of your mental health? Uh that you realized when you were a little bit uh, seasoned. Who wants to say that? Um, I think that's something that I didn't know that um, I probably know now is like I don't have I don't have all the answers, Sway. Like, you know, like that that's definitely the thing. I think that I thought that I could kind of self-heal mm-hmm. or that I could figure it out or I could create my own coping mechanisms and things like that. But, you know, coping and things like that is it's only temporary. It's only a band-aid, yeah. you know, and I think that um, that's definitely something that I learned was like you don't have to have all the answers you don't have to figure it out on your own Mm -hmm. and I think that when you go to therapy and really realize that other people are experiencing similar struggles you start to feel like oh okay this is pretty normal that I'm going through this or that you know I'm coping with alcohol or you know all these bad vices that's not really helping me so I think that that was truly helpful for me um, because it allowed me to feel human and it allowed me to not feel like I needed to kind of figure this out. Yeah. Um, so that was, um, I think, really helpful. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. And going back to coping and negative coping, right? Our phones, social media. Ah, oh, man. <laughs> so being a businesswoman, mm-hmm. how do you do with balancing that, being on your phone or social media all the time? I suck at it. That's the same, one. Same. I probably, I'm not good at it. And I want to get out of it only because I, I just truly, I think taking breaks are necessary from our cell phones. You know, like yesterday, I don't know if you all were aware that like Instagram was down, Twitter was down, I think, and everything was down. I'm like, we need that more often. Somebody, I was like, somebody in Canada or somewhere just pulled out a server and was like, yep. take a break. Like, you know, and I think that um, that's the same for us. Like, I think that sometimes, you know, we talked about it earlier with Kim the noise that sometimes you really need to kind of put your phone down put your phone away I think that you know we're probably so influenced by our phones by social media like it's probably dictating our relationships your career you know where you think you should be in life there's like so much pressure and so I think for me I kind of um, often remind myself that I'm in a race with myself and that I'm not like in a race with anyone you know sort of on social um, because I think it's it's just damaging so I think um, you know putting down your phones for, for some time and do you know like social media was created to be this like negative like this impact that it is now and so unfortunately because my business is online a lot of the times I'm you know scrolling or doing stuff but I think setting up boundaries or even telling yourself like alright late night maybe I see a lot of friends I haven't mastered this yet but I've heard good things about it but putting your phone like down downstairs and kind of yeah. you know not going to sleep with it in the bedroom or waking up to it the first thing in the morning and scrolling like those little things can probably be of a huge impact to your day and you know I admire like some people who are just you know really don't even know that social 
media was down yesterday. I'm like, how do y'all not know? You know? And I think that it's a beautiful thing though, because that means that they're just really tapped into other things. And um and I think it's just healthier. So um, you know, because right now if you look at what social media is doing, you know, it's causing a lot of depression. It causes a lot of, you know, like a lot of people kind of get caught up in the social media hype and you know they get lost in it. So I definitely think um mental health wise taking breaks from social media is just like it's necessary absolutely and especially like when you're talking about comparison because because compare comparison is the thief of joy absolutely <laughs> but also with social media too i see it as it's creating a new form of ptsd when you're seeing a lot of people who are going through a lot of tragic things killings mm. uh violence and yeah violence. Even if you try not to follow it and you scroll past it for a little bit, it's still burned into your mind. It definitely. really does. Because I think that there was one thing where, you know, when you would see news, like the things on, you know, a news station broadcaster, or you hear something on the radio, and you kind of even formulate your own thoughts to it, now we're at a different level where you're actually seeing someone die. You actually yeah. see someone lose the breath from their body, you know, and I try to kind of block again, create boundaries for my friends. And I'm like, look, y'all don't send me nothing crazy that has because, or even with violence, you know, I think, or even racial, like certain things, I think that it definitely, you know, it creates like your mind is now, it's warped. And even the things that you once believed and, you know, so I try to, again, protect my peace with certain things and, you know, that's kind of how. No, absolutely. It is important. And I know I spoke about coming from a toxic work environment. It is very, very important. But now that, you know, you're the big boss lady. So how do you ensure that your employees are prioritizing their mental health? It's really difficult because I think as an employee who's always been in employer, like I've always worked, I mean, uh, employee, like I've always been in a space of an employee. I'm now becoming an employer and I'm now, you know, being able to navigate my work environment and things like that. And I think the space that I dream of is that we can take lunch breaks and, you know, go to a yoga studio or we can, you know, we have something now within our shop. It's healthy mess, you know, so we do different like walk run challenges or, you know, we, you know, I try to promote healthy eating. So some of my staff members are now, you know, vegetarian or going vegan and things like that so you know it's it's small but you know for me I think it's definitely a big deal and I think I try my best to lead by example by running and doing certain things and sort of sort of promoting you know a healthy work balance even for them you know though we're a small company and I do tell you know most of my employees this you know um, my employees this I try to tell them you know that though I want them to go hard and love the business you definitely have to love yourself and make sure that you're taking care of yourself and not like overworking yourself Mm -hmm. Um, you know because it's just not I need them more than I want them to not be here and be sick you know so the goal right now is like take care take great care of yourself um, you know so that we could continue to have a healthy work environment as well no it's important definitely like I always tell people to pour from your overflow in your cup not what's actually within your cup because you have to have something for yourself. You cannot show up to other places and give energy out if you don't have energy for yourself, you know. Right. So really building that timing because it's, it's cr- crucial because I know with me, I was a workaholic at one point. No, no, no. Right. I done. Same. Like, work efficiently, work smarter. Oh, not for sure. Harder, for real. That's one thing a lot of people do not under uh, understand. And one thing too I like that you spoke about was eating habits. Um, a lot of that, a lot of people don't realize that with eating, it does affect your mental health. So a lot of high sugar, it can have a negative impact on you. Um, also, it can reverse some medical conditions too. I'm not a medical doctor, don't quote me, but it plays a big role. And especially when it comes to comfort eating, um, a lot of people may just eat and eat and eat, but it's for comfort to have that emotional fulfillment within themselves. So, you know, just being cautious of that. So if it's one of those things of you feel like you're hungry, drink some water. Yeah. And if you're still hungry after that, then okay, cool. But, you know, right. it's finding that balance. So I'm happy you really spoke to your employees about finding that balance when it comes to diet and whatnot. Yeah. So you talked about your employees. So what are some suggestions that you can give to our students who are at Morgan State and just people in general who are watching? 
You know, one of the advice I would give is so funny. I think um, one, incorporating any type of like exercise, keeping it moving. I think that sometimes we get so stuck behind our desk and stuff. We forget like, you know, that there's outside, that there's a basketball court, that there's tennis, that there's just jumping jacks that you can do. So I think one of the cool things that my staff, you know, on their breaks, they do like a jump rope challenge with each other. And I thought that was really cool. So I think kind of keeping it moving and getting that adrenaline going. I don't even think that we understand how important even something simple like that is and how it feels. Um, so I would really encourage um, you guys to like, you know, do things and to take breaks, um, I think is also extremely important. You know, everything is not, I know you have to study for a test, but imagine if you take X amount of time and sort of to yourself before an exam to kind of, you know, um, meditate, lose you know, um, do any type of yoga. I strongly recommend like yoga and stretching and things like that as well. You know, starting your day off with like any type of meditation regimen and things like that is super important because I realized for myself, like the stress is going to be there. The day is going to be there. Yep. The hectic things of the day is going to be there. So, you know, I really recommend um, for you to kind of center before going out into the world. Okay, okay. So we're going to take some questions from y'all. So if you have any questions, please line up behind the microphone. We're open books. Well, I'll tell you, uh, y'all can ask questions, so please go ahead. But a little, little fun one, right? So when you are feeling down and you just don't feel, feel like dealing with nobody, what's that song that you turn on that turns your mood up? <laughs> uh, ooh, um, I just saw Jeezy and Gucci. Um, Love is in a chain with the V cup. <laughs> yeah, I, I gotta get it. you know oh something, something gold teeth wearing, you know, um, hood slanging. Yeah, that's me on the low. Okay, got you, got you. Yeah, now music definitely has played a big role for me. Music therapy is big. Just so yeah. I don't know that for real. Um, and I also get yeah, in there, um, I'm Jamaican, so, like, culturally, honestly, like, you know, funny enough, like, just having my dad a part of my life, but um, just listening to really old school, like, Bevis Hammond and, you know, um, any type of Bougie Bantan, like, things like that, it just brings me into, like, a whole different mental space, yeah. um, you know, and it's just about my roots, my culture, you know, and it's just, it's feel Bob Marley, like, it really feels like it speaks to you. Mm. And so um, I think that's also really big for me. Okay, dope, dope, dope. And I gotta say, you know, I'm an Outcast fan, so I throw on like Liberation or Spoiler. Yeah, or delicious. Ooh, you know the song like, I love? My only son, China Line on the World. Yeah. Shana, that, that's my jam. <laughs> that gets me real zoned. Like all of that, like my playlist. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> playlist. <laughs> um, but does anybody have any questions at all? Real fast, real quick. Come on, hop on up. Yeah, there you go, there you go. Mm -hmm. Can you go ahead and just say your name? Oh, right there, right there. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Joshua Hamlet. I am a junior computer science major uh -huh. at Illinois State, and I'm also the vice president of the Intermural Volleyball Organization. And when you were talking about earlier about coping mechanisms, my question is, how would you establish, like, boundaries so you can stop your coping mechanisms from becoming unhealthy? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, I think that... Um, you know, so I did something in, um, I want to say 2019, I decided to cut out, I said, anything that almost like wasn't serving me. So I gave up and anything that I felt like, not addicted, but it was just anything that I felt like I needed. So again, I wasn't like addicted to alcohol. I never have been, but it really felt like I'd be like, oh, I need a glass of wine or, oh, it just, you know, it came with meals or social drinking and things like that and so I had to tell myself like it just felt like such a necessity like I'm like oh, I can't eat this meal I need a glass of wine and I was like okay no this is not healthy even though it wasn't excessive and so what I did was I literally I, I, this was my mantra a little bit I cut out meat liquor and assholes 
<laughs> and those were like my three things. Like so, I stopped eating meat. Um, well, I became a vegetarian. Um, I gave up like liquor, and I gave up people in the sense of like you know relationships, bad relationships in a sense, or even and friendships too. Honestly, like I gave up like friends who I just didn't feel like were you know not because they weren't going down the same path, but they really weren't serving and feeding like the the person that I wanted to be. And I had to really reflect and look at that. So anything that I felt like was necessity, so just like he said, sex and sex and alcohol, you know, it was like if I felt like I needed it, I just, and so I cut it out. I went to South Africa. I always got to put a major trip in there somewhere. So I went to South Africa, and, like, I, I came back. And when I came back, I stopped eating meat. I stopped, you know, and it just was really an inner cleanse for me like it wasn't something that I set out to say like and you know it allowed me to lose probably around like 40 50 pounds and it just was truly a cleanse where and I stopped drinking and you know what was funny um you know I realized within that year we social drink so much that like I would go out on dates and you know and it felt like the people I was going out on dates with couldn't entertain me without wanting to offer me alcohol and it was actually actually very interesting to watch and see like sort of how people sort of either can scramble or like if they can hold the conversation without like liquor being involved and it wasn't because you know I didn't like to drink or think that a social drinking was cool but it's like do some work like you know ask me about things other than my favorite color um and so I think it was a really interesting like experiment for myself and I literally did not drink that whole year um, and didn't eat meat, and now, um, you know, I think, what, three years later, I've now incorporated, you know, liquor here and there, but I go my spurts without doing it, so I think it's just really knowing yourself, knowing your body, and really deciding, like, you know, if you feel like it's a coping mechanism that isn't healthy, how can you detach yourself from it, and that's what I did. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it was more so out of sight, out of mind. So I didn't necessarily keep looking around. Um, I went celibate for about a year. Um, also, I really had to develop discipline because I realized I had it in some areas, but I didn't. So the major thing that helped me out was going pescatarian for four years. I only broke it because I'm back in Baltimore and they got some good restaurants now. <laughs> like, uh, so I came back in March and this past summer, that's when I um, broke it. But definitely it's one of those things of... Power of mindset, really. Um, and for me, I had to look at a lot of different situations, things I was doing, like, why is this happening to me? That's how I had that that victim mentality. But when I changed my mindset to a growth mentality of this is happening for me, to figure out why do I have this craving for liquor? Why do I have this for sex? Like, is it something that I'm missing? Do I feel like other people will fill me up when that's not the truth? So when I had that kind of aha moment, um, that's where it really made it easier, but it's really about the power of mindset, at least mm -hmm. for me, um, in my case, really. Yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions? He broke the ice, so you might as well. Go ahead. All right, so um, once you started attending therapy, did you notice a change? I know you kind of mentioned it, but did you notice a change in your friendships with the people that you were dating and your relationship? I know you mentioned that you went to South Africa. Mm hmm. Um, and, you know, change, but did, it, did therapy give you a clearer look? on like the people that surround you um are they fulfilling you are they um pouring their stuff into you and not you're not able to give back um how did therapy help you with your friendships yeah so i think for me like therapy um it allows you, it gives you the tools, you know, it doesn't give you the answers per se. And I think that sometimes people go to therapy thinking like you're going to, you know, they're going to get, the therapist is going to give you the answer. But I think in reality, the therapist is giving you the tools. They're giving you the things to get to the answer for yourself. And so I think what therapy allowed me to do was sort of really assess like the people around me and to figure out like if the path that I'm going on or if, and, and, you know, Know, is it still fulfilling and also maybe to also um not, maybe to give 
the people next to me too a bit of grace like you know it's not their fault in the sense that you know you might be either surpassing or slowing down or not y'all may not be going at the same pace and I think also with people going from like let's say high school you have like your neighborhood friends and then you now have your college friends you know I think in my mind I've gotten to a place where like different groups of friends serve different purposes for me and like you know and not being so heavy on on the friendship too so I think when you are focused on like really healing yourself and working on yourself and I think a big thing that therapy did teach me was like not everyone can one understand the journey that you're on but truly be able to kind of talk to you about like your next step or your next growth you know so because some friends they're just not there that that's just not their outlook yet and so it might be a little bit difficult for them to really you know cope and understand like what you might be going through so if you're going through something in college and they're still you know back at home and that's not what they're on they're not gonna understand they're just looking at you like oh you at college complaining about you know eating the same thing every day where I'm in the hood and I'm having a difficult day or whatever so I think that it gave me the opportunity going to therapy really allowed me to give like those friendships grace where I'm like they won't understand some of the things that I'm going through and that was okay too yeah um I necessarily haven't had the best relationship with therapy yet um I found one therapist it wasn't the best but I would say to people that therapy is like dating you have to go through the therapist, see who works with you, who doesn't, um, personality-wise, all that good stuff. And it really does provide you with the tools to sort through what you're going through. But you have to actually do that homework that they provide you. You got to do the work. You got to do that work. And even if you're lying to them, that's not going to help you either. That's what they don't even realize. <laughs> um, but for me, I think the real work came when I developed my emotional intelligence. So learning about my self-awareness, how I deal with other people, how to read the room, um, how to deal with emotion when I'm feeling it. So with that, it allowed for me to see a lot of different things. And I had to realize that my peace is number one. If for some reason you're disturbing my peace, if I get a weird feeling in my stomach when you're around, that's my intuition saying, like, you're not... Um, out of there. Get out of there. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I love you, but... <laughs> yeah, got to keep love you from a distance, really. And necessarily, I think therapy did help me the short period was to really speak my mind. Because before, I was very quiet, a people pleaser, all that good stuff. Um, but now, I have no issue with telling you how it is and not sugarcoating at all. Um, from a respectful place, of course, you know, mm -hmm. respectfully, you know, we keep yeah. it going. But um, that's really what it allowed for me to do, to really speak my mind freely and not be afraid of the consequences. Um, it's more so about keeping the peace within my mind versus keeping the peace in my physical environment. I don't care right. about that, the physical right. environment. As long as I have peace of mind, that's the most important thing to me. That's huge. Uh, any other questions? Any other questions? Come on up. Got the sash on. What's the sash for? I'm a, I'm a stay position in just a second. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, I'm, can hear me? Okay. I'm Kristen Sweets. I'm a junior business administration major. I currently serve as Miss Soul for the 2021-2022 academic school year. Congrats, congrats. Thank you. <laughs> um, I would like to, I know you mentioned earlier about dealing with people who have different situations than yours. How often... And how do you deal with people who like to, like, make stuff a competition? Like, you talk about what you have going on, and then they're like, well, I have this going on. It's not the same thing. Like, how do you deal with people who like to, like, make stuff a competition? <laughs> Beyonce wrote a song, Ego. <laughs> right, yeah. I think, you know, one, I had to really assess. Um, so I had a really good friend, and she was in architecture with me. And she was the one of the only other, like, black, you know, uh, women students in our um, class. And we connected a lot, but I did feel like there was a lot of, unfortunately, not competition, but it was a lot of comparison. That's a better word. And what I realized is like her and I were totally different. And, um, you know, and I think that when you, when competition happens, it, it's because like one person might lack and they look 
up to what someone else might be doing and it creates this struggle for them. And so I think the way that I've dealt with like competition and you know, when it presents itself in a space, um, I'm always like, I'm more looking at the person who's competing with me because as I already said, I'm only competing with myself. So when we at that start line and we all have to, you know, you heard hear the gunshot and we all have to run together, I'm literally looking straight. I'm not looking to my left or the right. But when I see someone who is and they're focused and they're trying to inch up and closer you know I'm always looking at it like that's something for them to resolve and not for me so I sort of don't play into that because then you know I, I may know it in the back of my mind like oh, okay this person clearly is trying to you know compete with me but there is no competition so for me I kind of have learned to sort of forget that part of it and I'm I'm always hopeful that that person resolve it. And I think one of the big things that I do is um, I'm quick to kind of tell you that, um, you know, especially for other black women, like I'm not competing with you at all. You know, it's not a competition. How can I help you? And that's always my attitude towards it is like, what can I do to sort of, how can we help each other? And because we're not, com we're just not even in the same lane. Like that's how I feel. So I'm like, what can we do to kind of push each other forward? Like there is, and so I think repeating that language and letting like especially another sister to know like we we're not doing this like there is you know and I think that sometimes also helps the relationship because then that person maybe you know thinks about it for themselves and they're like oh you're right like you like a totally different color than I do like we're not even we're just not even on that same path so that's kind of my reaction is like I act as if there is no competition yeah um I look at it as that's a reflection on what's going on with them. It has nothing to do with me. Um, I believe that we all have our own natural gifts, um, not just from school, just things in general that you can implement in your life. And for me, no one's in my lane because I'm on a totally different highway that's going somewhere else far away that people don't know of. So, you know, for me, it's like I am in competition myself, just like Kalia said, definitely. Like, I don't care what you're doing. I will always applaud you. Um, I can stand and cheer while the other fellow stars. But when it comes to my stuff, I'm like, okay, I am just had tunnel vision. I'm like, it doesn't really matter to me. You know, I'm going to do what I do no matter what. Um, so it's one of the things I really, I don't give it energy if they're coming to me straight with that envious or jealousy, et cetera, whatever energy it is. Because, you know, again, it's reflection on them, you know. And, yeah. and then, to, yeah. and as long as to me, if you don't feed into it, like the person's fighting with themselves, that's their inner struggle. So you know, they'll quickly probably realize, like, okay, I'm bugging, like yeah. it's not even worth, you know, like it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. So unless they sabotaging your stuff intentionally, then okay, you gotta have a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> you know, situations going on, mm -hmm. but, uh, but other than that, yeah, like I said, it's just a reflection on them. Um, any other questions? Any other questions? Come on up! Come on up! Yeah, a live legal group. Hi, <laughs> my name is uh, Makai. Um, I'm a multi-platform production major. Um, one of the questions I want to say is, how exactly is the best way to appreciate the, accomp the accomplishments that you come across in your path, and not just your mental health journey, but in life, and not let people offset your, you know, you're in your zone, you're in the element, but, you know, how do you help maintain that? So, um, something that I do every year, I kind of, um, I forget about all of the amazing shit that I do every, like every year. I really do. Cause like I do a lot of stuff. And so, and I think that sometimes we don't clap for ourselves enough. Yep. So like what I do every year at the end of the year is I try to go through my phone cause I take 5 million pictures. So I go through my phone and I sort of write every month, like just some of the big things, you know, whatever. And I kind of look at the full year of the scope and then it allows me to you know sort of pat myself on the back and be like okay you know like you are doing it also another good thing to do is I write down a lot of like goals for the quarter and I tell myself like what things do I want to accomplish every quarter and so for me I sort of like use that as a check mark and sort of see like am I actually doing the things that I say I'm going to do do you actually accomplish it so I think like giving yourself like self recognition and making sure that you sort of remember like you know what you're working hard for you know and um, ensuring that you know you tell yourself you know you're doing a good job so yeah just like the song you're doing a good yes, job I know I was thinking <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but 
for me, I actually have a very good friend, um, Tiana. It was a great shout out to you. Mm -hmm. uh, she gave me a good things jar. So every thing, so, time something good happens, I write it down and I put it in the jar. Oh, that's cute. And I whenever like I feel bad or depression hit me, pull one out. I'm like, okay, you, you've been there, done that. You know? And it's just a reminder, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that sometimes we need that. Absolutely. And also celebrating those small wins, you know, whether it's um, treating yourself to some extra cookies from the calf because they be hit, <laughs> or maybe, uh, going out somewhere, treating yourself, dressing up, like celebrating those small wins. For and, sure. You know, because oftentimes we put a lot of energy towards the stressors of things, but we don't put enough energy to those positive things that are coming to us. So, you know, just you, you got to talk yourself to yourself sometimes, you know? Definitely. Any other questions? Any other questions? Come on up, come on up. <laughs> hello, hello. My name is Nathania. I am a senior industrial engineering major, and you? I serve as the community service chair for Seoul. My question would be, um, what advice would you give students who feel like there's not enough time? You know, we have a lot of assignments. Some of us commute. We have work. We have to shower, sleep, eat. What if we feel like we just don't have enough time to incorporate things to help our mental health? Well, there's never going to be enough time, but you have to make time, especially for your mental health. You know, that's why I was saying, like, waking up at 5 o'clock in the morning, it's about what you're committed to and what your intentions are. You know, like, for me, like, whether it's journaling, whether it's meditating, also, like, you'll be amazed what five minutes of your time will do. You'll be amazed what 30 minutes of exercise could do, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, you know what I mean? So I think that at the end of the day, like, if you are going to be committed and even thinking about like, you know, I don't know if you're anything like me, but scrolling sometimes, being on social, getting distracted, whatever it is, it's just like take back some of your time, no matter what. And like, you know, um, and strategically thinking, you know, if something's across the hall, like maybe if you have an early class, maybe it is the fact that you might not be able to meditate, you know, but maybe you do a lunchtime meditation, you know, like how do you really reflect and look at your schedule to put in and and, you know, if you're, again, anything like me, you may even need to put it into your calendar, like under lunch, like meditate for 10 minutes. And that's something, you know, it alarms on your phone, you make sure you do it, all of that stuff. It's, sometimes it's, it's, it's difficult, but it's necessary if you are committed to it. Yeah. Using the calendar is definitely clutch, like Khalil said, definitely. You build in that time. But I would say do not sacrifice your sleep between six to nine hours of sleep uh, per day. Uh, make sure you're not sacrificing your time to eat because you need sleep and you need fuel. Those are two things. And definitely being conscious of the scrolling or if you're a talker, sometimes a five-minute conversation goes 30 minutes an hour. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really just being efficient with your time and also working smarter. What can you automate in a sense mm -hmm. if it's possible? Um, so really it's just one of those things of just finding that that, that balance when it comes to time um, with time management and whatnot. But there's some options, but you know, if you see you're sleeping for hours or you're partying, you know, that's going to take away from the times you got to, things you got to do. Sometimes you got to sacrifice for life, you know. It's not always going to be fun. You have to put in work for your future self to appreciate what you do now via your sacrifices and whatnot, so. Yeah, I totally agree. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, my name is Ahmad Conte. I'm a junior information systems major, president of Society for the Advancement of Computer Science. The question that I had, well, actually for both of y'all, since y'all both are like entrepreneurs, what's the greatest piece of advice or advices, if it's multiple, that you could give to people wanting to pursue entrepreneurial uh, paths but are kind of like scared to go all in well what I say all the time is failure is progress you know so you definitely have to fail forward um, so it doesn't you know if you are afraid that's okay but you have to dis decide if you're going to allow the failure to like sort of hinder you from moving forward and even like you know if I was if I didn't follow my dream and follow my gut and make mistakes and fail at some things I wouldn't be where I am today you know so I strongly recommend that you allow yourself to fail forward 
forward and to sort of, you know, figure it out as you go. Um, but I think also being knowledgeable and smart enough, of course, to like map some things out and like have a true plan, it's important. Um, but I don't, I, you know, it's not, don't allow fear to cripple you and stop you from like going out there. And sometimes I think too, like um, many entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs, they want to wait till things are perfect. They want to wait till things are like, you know, to the T and whatever. And I'm like, that's not going to help you. Like you need to just, because sometimes you go on a path and you don't even think that that's where the business or that you'll have, you'll make money, but that's truly what, you know, you, what you might need. So, you know, go ahead and start. Um, that's the biggest thing is starting and just sort of seeing where it takes you. Yeah. Um, definitely touching on uh, a little bit what Clea said. Uh, perfectionism is another form of procrastination. I am guilty of that, <laughs> definitely. Um, but ultimately, it's about executing. Just get it done. Get it out there. Um, the, a lot of people don't even realize that you messed up on something or it wasn't your greatest quality because right. you're the one that knows that, definitely. Um, so that's a big thing that's been for me. Also, um, second master's degree, probably the three words that I got out of it the most, culture trump strategy. So just because you have a plan doesn't mean you have to stick to it. If you see that the conditions that you're going through or just certain things aren't happening, okay, adjust. Pivot and adjust. That's the main thing. So culture, Trump strategy. No problem. <laughs> come on up. <laughs> we need some uh, music when y'all come up. <laughs> um, my name is Gigi, and I serve as Miss Latinx Student Association. Um, my question is, how do you deal with toxic leadership without quitting um, the work and uh, necessarily removing yourself completely from the environment um, and how do you know that you're not the one if you're in a leadership position how do you know that you're not the one who's becoming toxic even though you are trying to deal with your own um, healthy um, coping mechanisms if that makes sense well that's a really good question I mean I think for me some of that um, I tackle head-on um, and meaning you know sometimes you have to just um, you know, decide, like, what ways can you really not truly cope, but, like, make sure that the environment, because just because you may want to stay in the space, if it's not a healthy environment, it may just not be fit for you and the best place for you. Um, but if you do love what you're doing and things like that, I definitely do recommend, like, just going at it head on, like trying to see how you could either resolve it or also letting the person know, like sometimes leadership, you know, they may not know that they are bringing a level of toxicity. They may not know that there is things that they can do that, you know, that they truly could do better. Um, they may be overwhelmed by the things that they are going through and, you know, and you may be able to sort of be the calm or bring some of that po positive, you know, um, positivity that they may need that they didn't even know. So I think sometimes like we look at it as leadership and people are, you know, um, kind of hindering how you may move forward. Um, but I think that maybe if you are able to talk to the leadership and kind of let them know and how you think you can be of best help also to them may be um, a really strong um, way to approach it. Effective communication definitely is key, mm -hmm. but if they're not receptive, then that can be an issue, definitely. Um, always start off conversations that are tough with um, listen to understand, not to respond, and take at least three seconds before responding to ensure that it's going to be a positive contribution to the actual um, conversation that we're having at hand. Um, if that doesn't work with communication and whatnot, um, I'm a big fan of keeping documentation. And ultimately, if nothing changes, you have to remove yourself from the right. situation sometimes. Um, I've walked out of jobs because of that. <laughs> you know, having documentation, having multiple calm, mature, efficient conversations. But leadership wasn't getting it. Too bad. So sad. You know, go where you're celebrated, not where you're tolerated. Definitely. You could be you could be the person that is, but I think that again it takes self reflection, and I think um something that someone um advised me of is you know maybe um 
if a good initiative on both ends, like someone who is maybe toxic may not understand like how they're being, you know, to their um, to the community. And so maybe also as you know, um, one of the things you can recommend is, hey, is it possible for us to do any type of self assessment, or you know, that way you could give like real effective communicate, you know, feedback to what you're seeing, and you know, because I think sometimes you're waiting for the um, like the the leader to lead or in that direction, but they could be really occupied where I think maybe sometimes you can possibly come to them and say, hey, I wanted to do this, you know, um, kind of self-reflection with you to see how I'm doing so that, you know, I could also give some feedback to how I think, you know, you could be a better leader for us. All right. So we're close to ending. Uh, we do have to wrap. So we have one more question, if possible. If not, we're going to wrap right there. Uh, any other questions? One last question. One last question. All right. Well, perfect. Thank you all for the questions that you submitted. Um, so, Kalia, please tell the folk them how they can find you. Hey, you guys can find us on Instagram, Twitter, um, uh, Facebook at Mess in a Bottle, or check out our website uh, www.messinabottle.com. All right, and you can check out my organization, the Real Talk Session Series, and the Miseducation of the People podcast by going to www.realtalksessionseries.org. And we also are on all social media platforms at Real Talk Session Series. Uh, this is actually the first episode of season two for the podcast. You know, we take long, insecure Atlanta breaks, so we're going to be back. <laughs> but um, definitely uh, make sure you check us out and get your shirts right there yes. at the merch store. Get the merch store, you know. But uh, definitely appreciate you all for coming out. Kalia, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Um, thank you to NAMI Metropolitan Baltimore, um, Office of Student Life and Development, Alpha New Omega, uh, am I missing anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> and this is Morgan State University in general, and our students for coming up, showing up, showing out, and asking questions. Truly do appreciate you all, and thank you all to who tuned in on uh, Facebook and watching the replay. So, again, let's keep the conversation going. Drop some comments, some questions within the comment box, and we'll see you later. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys.